So, uh, I'm Brian Ballinger, and uh, I, I live in Huntington. Anybody live near Huntington? Anybody been to Huntington? Yeah. Was it the most exciting place you've ever... Okay. So, uh, I live in Huntington. I uh, am a toy designer, and I, am, I teach 3D computer graphics, uh, college level. And I am a children's book illustrator and author, and I'm a muralist. So if you've seen the mural in the children's section, the 360 degree one, I did that uh, over there. Um, and I'm going to be talking about I, the 3D printing and kind of the way that uh, I develop the characters and then how I build them and all of that. And I have a lot that I can talk about, and since everybody in here is like, all over the place in experience and what you might be interested in. I'm okay asking questions and sort of, you know, being flexible. Um, okay, so we'll start with this. So this is kind of an overview of what I'm gonna talk about and then I am totally fine concentrating on any of this. So this is going through the artistic side, the technical side, all different kinds of stuff. So. Um, this is my, my design, and this is my process for uh, creating and 3D printing and designing toys. Um, I start with a sketch, of course, lots of drawings. Um, you'll see that I do a lot of dogs because I love dogs. Um, so I, I start with a, a sketch and a drawing, and then I model and sculpt it in 3D, in 3D software. Um, then I in 3D on the computer, I paint it um, only because uh, that gives me reference for when I hand paint it. And so I can figure everything out digitally first, so I'm not going to make any mistakes, and I can use it for reference, so I always paint it on the computer. Then I do what's called rendering, so I'll render it out in 360 degrees. What that allows me to do is easily look at it from any angle as I'm really painting it. So I can have it up on a monitor and, and you'll see, and I'm going to show you all this. Uh, so I can see it from all angles and look at it and then, you know, paint it. Um, then uh, then there's, it's, uh, I take it into uh, software that prepares it to 3D print, which is called slicing and supporting it. Uh, anybody in here ever use lychee? One person. We're the lychee bros. Lychee is my favorite slicing software. So this is for resin 3D printing. It will do uh, filament too, but that's not what we're going to talk about. And then uh, printing, and I do resin 3D printing. So most of the printers you saw over there were not resin. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the benefits and pros and cons of resin printing. Um, and then after it's printed, I paint it. And then in the case of toys, uh, I send that to the toy company to use as like an example of this is what I want it to look like. So, so that's a good point. You yes. Said, uh, you were happy with the way the faulty dogs came out. Yes. That means the factory got as close or identical to what you sent them. They got spot on. Okay. Yep. Yep. But yeah, it helps because then they can just sit there and hold. I give them a digital file too because that's what they use to create it. But actually having that there so that when they have the finished product, they can say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, yep, yep, and it super helps to be able to send them that file. No, unfortunately, there's really no United States companies that will do it yet. I would love to, though. I would much prefer it. Yeah, yep. All right, uh, okay, so talked about sketches. I'm just going to go through and show you a couple drawings of. So uh, again, dogs are really big. I love doing dogs. Uh, so there's a drawing. And you can see um, my drawings are they're a little odd. And part of the fun is translating this into 3D, which is not always easy, um, especially when you draw like me, i.e., this is not like something you would do in CAD. So there's another dog. Uh, and another one. So I draw all the time. Uh, anybody in here use Procreate? Okay, good. 
Yes, I draw. I do all my drawings in Procreate now. Uh, love Procreate. And by the way, Procreate is also awesome for painting your 3D models. So there's another dog. Another one. There's that. Yeah. There's that one, which is right here. And this is the one that I'm going to be showing as examples. I call this one the forehead dog. But, um, oh, yeah. There's the drawing for for that one. Me? I call this one the trash can dog because it kind of looks like. All right, so uh, the next thing, the next step would be, ah, okay, Nomad. Have you used Nomad? It's on the iPad, right? Yes. Yeah, and I wrote it, I just haven't gotten into it. Okay, it's worth really getting into it. Um, okay, so I'm going to really quick here s switch to my iPad. All right, this going away. Don't be scared. It's going to come back on my iPad. When, when did 3D printing come into existence? How many years ago? Uh, it's been around for quite a while, but it's really hit its stride and become affordable in, I don't know, like the past three or four years. Um, so, you know, it used to be thousands and thousands of dollars to get a 3D printer. A couple hundred now will get you going. So, yeah. And the software to use it has um, really gotten a lot more user friendly, except for ZBrush. <laughs> ZBrush is not user friendly until you really learn it. Ah, come on. Brian, is your, <coughs> is your Apple Pencil, is that or is it the second one? It is, and I really like it. I just, just got one. I like it a lot. Do you like it? Yeah. I Yeah. The, I find the Apple Pencil to be the best stylus around. Of course, Wacoms are nice, but the Apple one is, it's the bomb. All right. Da, 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 da. I know it's going to come up. Oh, there we go. All right. So. This is Nomad on the iPad. And so what I do is I bring my drawing into Nomad. And this is a sculpting program. So it's like you are using clay on the tablet. So if you're uh, like a, anybody in here sculpt in clay or have done sculpting in clay, so this is the closest you're going to get to doing that uh, digitally. So instead of like CAD or other 3D modeling programs where you're working with polygons, this is more like you're working with clay that you're kind of mushing things together. So if I was going to build like this guy, I would probably just go and add, I don't know, like a box. Um, and then I would make a simple box. Let's go ahead and uh, move it over here, move it over here. Squidge it down. So basically what you want to do when you're making this, these things like this in 3D is you're making primitive shapes, simple shapes, and you put them into the different parts of it, and then you will mush them all together, and then you will go in and carve and, and sculpt in the details. So if I started with a really complex thing and I'm trying to get into it, that is, uh, is not a really a great way to do it. So, okay, so you're like, okay, there's a box, but it's hard edged. So I need to go in and change the parameters on this. So I'm going to take it down to where it's a lot simpler, and then I'll start rounding that until it gets more round like his head would be. And then, I don't know, okay, so I will then, uh, I don't know, I'm going to clone that, which means I'll make a copy of it um, just to save time. And then I would, you know, get his body down there. And so this is all in 3D now. I'll, of course, we don't want him that thick. Or maybe you do. I don't know. It's up to you. 
uh, and then, uh, so you know, I've got these two pieces, and then uh, I'm not going to go through and model this whole dog, by the way. But um, then we get the two pieces, and then I can uh, quickly merge them. And so I, I've merged them, and so now you can kind of see that this is now just one piece. And then I've got all these brushes here, and I can go through and I can smooth that so that it's a much um, less of a hard edge, if that's what I want. And then now that I have that, and then um, you can go in and you can, whoa, I have an alpha there that I need to not have there. OK, so. And I have this. I just did a demo for my students on how to model a uh, Oreo cookie. So all my settings are set to modeling Oreo cookies. So just keep that in mind. There we go. OK, so let me turn up the strength here. And so you can see I can now sculpt on that as if it was clay. Um, and you, know, you can carve into it or out of it, into it, out of it, et cetera. Uh, so this is Nomad. It's like, I don't know, 15, 20 bucks. Uh, runs on an iPad or an iPhone or an Android device. Any of those things. Super, uh, super affordable. And uh, it really isn't that hard to kind of get up and running and using it. So I highly, if you're going to do organic characters and things, Nomad is awesome. And it is also something that, um, you know, it's kind of all age groups can kind of pick it up, and it is is great. And it will create models that you can then take right into doing 3D printing with. All right, so after Nomad, um, then uh, what I do is I will take this model and I will send it over to Procreate, which is a painting program. And it's used for painting and drawing, but it also will let you draw and paint on a 3D model. And again, I do this uh, so that I have reference for it. So let me see here. OK. So if I, I'll just pick a color here. And you've got all these different painting brushes. And you can just paint right on the model and color it in however you want. So super handy for. And Procreate, if, you've, if you like to draw and paint, Procreate is the app for doing that. It is great. It is just great. So um, yeah, and then I'll show you what this looks like. Let me get this. So I've got all these different layers. So what I would do is I would say, OK, I want him to be gray. And I just kind of fill him in gray. By the way, you can paint. And if I have time, I will show you this. You can paint. Uh, in Nomad, the reason I don't do that as much is because the way that it does it, it's hard to bring it into other software to render it out because of the way it does it. So that's why I like Procreate. Yes, question? Do you know if someone 3D I don't think so. But yes? Is Procreate No. Okay. It needs UV maps. Oh, okay. But uh, Nomad is which is why it's annoying to then try and bring into something that he likes to use UV maps. Good question. Back there, yes. So it depends on the size. So something, I don't know, something like this would take, me, take uh, probably uh, 10 hours. Yep. Of course, it depends on the printer as well and the resin you're using for resin 3D printing. OK, so I filled this in gray. And then um, what's great is also, uh, unlike uh, other, some other 3D painting softwares, this has layers, which are great. So then I would I'd sort of paint in some faux shadows. So it's a little darker under places. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, he needs some spots and some other stuff. And then I add in even more detail, even more. You want to get some contrast up there. So I add some other colors. And now I add some little highlights on there. And then, um, yeah, and then the eyes, the same thing. So start heading in. 
and you can see it starts to come together and there's the nose and again I really like this too because you've got because of the layers in there let's say that I don't you know those highlights on his nose I decide that they are too bright well then I can just adjust them up and down by themselves so super handy yes back there Yes, but it is, well, yes. So it's not as easy to use. Uh, there's a couple ones. One is ZBrush, which will do everything Nomad does and a lot more, but it's not easy to use at all, and it's more expensive. Um, and then there's Blender, which is free, but again, is more complicated and does like everything. So it'll do every kind of 3D thing you want, not just sculpting like this. So really, uh, Nomad is kind of in a class of its own in its ease of use and all of that. So yes, but there are, Blender would probably be the one to look at um, and then just learn the sculpting part of it. And that's free. And Blender's pretty awesome. But if you're, uh, having a bent towards tech, techie stuff will help you with that too. Okay, so then, uh, I uh, take this and then okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch back here to the PC. All right, there we go. Okay, so. Um, the next thing I do is, like I said, I render it out. So I render it all the way around at 360 degrees so that then I can just sit there and look at it when I'm painting it. So I'm going to sh just show you quick. There's what it looks like when it's rendered out. And so I can just scrub back and forth and see what it looks like all the way around. Plus, I can also share this on social media and stuff, which is a nice, you know, it's a fun thing to do. Yes? Is it okay. So. You can, there are a lot of different things you can render uh, things out in. And um, this is in a program called KeyShot. I love KeyShot because it's so easy. I can just drop it in there, hit a couple buttons, and it renders it out. Uh, the downside to it is KeyShot is not cheap. Um, so you could render this. Um, hmm, if I wasn't using KeyShot, Blender would be able to render it out. Great. Um, but yeah, that's what I use. Uh, now, push come to shove, you could also, I could just have it sitting in Procreate and orbit it around too. So that would work too. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple other renders that I did because, okay, so if you guys have seen the mural over there, uh, I did take some of the characters and I built them uh, as toy versions. So here's the kangaroo from over on the mural and rendered out so that was all modeled in in uh, Nomad and then painted in Procreate and rendered out and here's the 3D print if you want to come up and look at that later yes um, during the rendering process you were able to like change the texture so like the noses tend to be really shiny yes so you can change the materials that's another reason why I like to render it out in something like KeyShot so I can make some of it some parts shiny um, some parts more matte, etc. Good question. Okay. Oh, yeah. Here's the, the penguin from over there. So, yeah, if you haven't seen the mural, go check it out, and you can kind of see how that translates. And I'll, I'll show you a little later what I did with that penguin, too. All right. Uh, then, uh, okay. So then uh, what I do is I've got the model, I've got my reference, now I need to prep it for 3D printing. Now, I like to do things in ZBrush to get it prepped because it has a few tools that I like a lot uh, for getting it ready to 3D print. However, you could do all of that in Nomad. It will, you could completely get it ready to go in Nomad. Um, but I'm just going to show ZBrush really quick just because that's... Um, that's what I like. Okay, so here's the model in ZBrush. ZBrush, you can see, has an interface. 
that uh, is weird. Okay, so uh, here it is in ZBrush, and um, basically what I need to do is you need to make anything that you're going to 3D print in resin has to be what's called watertight. So think of it as an inflatable animal that can't have any holes in it. Um, and so to do that, uh, what I would do is, uh, it has a great tool in here. Now I could, of course, uh, dynamesh it, but we're not going to dynamesh it. You know what I'm going to do? What am I going to do instead? Almost. Sort of, yes. Um, so ZBrush has a, has a command, remesh by union. And it is the best. So what it does basically is instead the other, like if you did it in Nomad, uh, you can see this has this little hard edge. And it would fill that in, but it would be kind of rough and a little bit ugh. And so uh, the reason I do it in here is just because this remesh by union um, makes a nice, clean um, seam right there. OK, so that has made it all one piece. Uh, so the eyes and the nose and the head are all one piece, because we can't have separate pieces. Uh, and then, the, then this also has some other uh, really nice features where sometimes when you do this, um, it will have little pieces on the inside that are kind of sitting in there, and you need to get rid of those. Otherwise, it's like when it 3D prints, nothing's holding it up, and it can float down. It's just you don't want little pieces in there. So um, I, I just hit this delete. I did a command where it selected a little piece of it, and then it grew it to all of it. And now it's currently got everything selected except any little pieces that might be inside. And so then I hit delete hidden, and it deletes all those little pieces. Then I hit close holes just in case so there's no holes in it. And then I hit uh, fix mesh, which just kind of cleans it up. And now uh, it's almost ready to send over. So the other last thing that you, you want to do is that um, this currently has millions of polygons. So that means it's really here. Um, so you can see it's made up of all these little squares. And uh, you kind of, when you're 3D printing, you want to have as few of those as possible, but have it still look good. So uh, I'm not going to go totally into it, but ZBrush has a way of reducing that down to a lot fewer, and it still looks good. Uh, Nomad also has that command. So it's called decimation. Yes? Uh, right, yeah. Uh, I found that a million or less. Yep, and a lot of times you don't need you don't need a million, but once it gets over a million, it starts to bog down the slicing software, and yeah, I mean once it's sliced, which I'll be getting into that, and sorry for those non-technical people who don't even know what that means. Uh, once it's sliced, the, the polygons are gone anyway. But okay, so we reduce that. We got that in ZBrush. Good, good, good. Okay, so next I take it into the <coughs> software that. Uh, you actually send it to the 3D printer with. And I believe I have that right here. So uh, as you can see, I use a lot of software for this. This is called Lychee. Lychee is, uh, I don't know what it is, like $40 a year license. Um, Lychee is my favorite software for getting it ready to print for resin 3D printing. There are a lot of other ones, um, but that. I've tried them all, and this one is the one I like the best. So anyway, so here it is. And so basically what you need to do is, OK, so see this box that's all the way around? That's the size that my 3D printer can print. And so that's, that's how big. And then so in here, I can set how big I want it to be. So if I was printing this, um, it is 4.67 inches high. And so you set the size of it. And then you have to uh, also, what's called orient it. That means that you do not want to print this like it's currently sitting here. 3D printing likes things to be at an angle because the, if you have a lot of surface area on the bottom, it does, the resin 3D printers don't like that. It's like giving a lot of force. So if I angle it, then it has less surface area on the bottom. So you want to angle it 
typically you start with around 45 degrees. Um, so there it is, angled really nicely. And then uh, you want to go uh, and you now need to decide if you're going to hollow it. So if I printed this right now, it would be absolutely solid, which sometimes is good, uses a lot of resin. Maybe you don't want it that dense and that heavy so you can hollow it. Yes, question? What would happen if it wasn't angled? If it wasn't angled, it might print fine, but it also might put stress on it and then, and then it would fail. And so you would print and you would end up with a mush pile and things sticking out weird. And we don't want that. And then you got to take the whole thing apart and clean it, and it's a nightmare. So uh, don't do that. <laughs> yes, good question. So, sorry. Yes, uh, yeah, no, I, know, I love it. Uh, there's tons and tons of software out there. Yes. You were, not that we're shopping for a 3D printer, but are there the printers here, for example, they say, OK, we'll, we'll print this. What do you use? Do you use Lychee? Do you use? Now, Lychee will, you can prep models for that currently under beta, and I haven't used it. Uh, there are other softwares that are like Prusa, Prusa Slicer, I think that's one that people really like. Yeah, but there are other slicers more specific for those kinds of printers. Yes. But they're doing sort of some similar things. So, okay, so I've rotated this. Now you might think, okay, can we print it? No, because this will print upside down and attached to a plate. So I need to add supports because uh, this would just turn into garbage if I tried to print it like this. So, but like I said, we got to decide if we want to hollow it. So I, uh, this is showing you how it's going to 3D print and it 3D prints in a whole bunch of thin slices. Um, and I'm going to hollow this out because I typically hollow everything because it saves on resin. Uh, and if I want to make it heavy later, I fill it with sand. Then it is nice and heavy if I want it that heavy. Um, okay, so I'm going to hollow it. And so you can basically pick how thick you want it to be. And then um, you just hit a button. Now you can hollow these things in ZBrush too, but man, this is so much faster. So there it is. That's what it looks like hollow. And then I can change how thick that is um, and ready to go. Now, one thing you got to be careful of is if you get an area, which I am not really, if you get an area like, say, this nose, if that nose was hollow and it uh, did not connect to another larger hollow area, it's going to stay filled with resin. And then you're going to print this out and then some point maybe the resin expands and it cracks or you drop it and then you've got crappy resin everywhere that's a pain to clean up and never evaporates. So uh, if that didn't have one there you would want to add what are called blockers and so there's a way to add a little piece of geometry in there that will stop it from hollowing. I'm not going to go into that part of it and then you can you also need to add holes to this. Uh, why? Can anybody tell me why I would want to add a hole to this hollow model? Yes? If you don't add a hole in the hollow model, there's going to be a ton of resin inside. And if the resin inside is going to expand, it's going to explode. We do not want exploding resin. The other thing is it could potentially explode as it's printing. Now, it's not going to explode and you know, burn down your house but it's going to be a mess that you don't want to clean up. So you, you got to make it so that there's no pressure in there and there's no resin. Now, can anybody tell me why I need to add two holes? Yes. Right. So if you only have one hole, it doesn't drain very well. You ever tried to shake something out and it's only got, there's no way for air to go in. So you got to add two holes. And when you add a hole, you typically want to add one of them at the absolute lowest point that you can where it's hollow. So here, I would probably go in and add a hole down there. And there, boom, I clicked. Now I have a hole and I can change the size of it so that it's a little more there. So, and then you can add the other hole anywhere. Uh, another tip, you want to add a hole where it's not going to show up as much and where it's easy to fill. So I don't want to add a hole right here. That would be bad. Up here where it's nice and flat, 
super easy to fill that hole, sand it down, and I'm done. Another benefit to resin 3D printers versus the filament kind, they print really smooth, so you have to do very little sanding. Um, okay, so we got holes, etc. cetera. Uh, next, you have to add, I'm going to add a raft. A raft is basically just a base at the bottom. Um, so I just click that, and now there's a base down there, and that's where everything can connect to. So adding a base. You don't have to do this. I always do this because it gives more support. And then you go to supports, and now you're, it's going to, you can add supports. Now, a lot of people like to do this from scratch, one support at a time, and they'll just kind of click here, and, and if they're really good, you'll know where to put them. I do a combination where uh, I am uh, quite impatient, and so I use this generate automatic support button does a fine job, um, and then, then what I do is I go in and I tweak it a little bit. Um, but there it goes, doo -doo 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 -doo. almost there, almost there. So it added 209 supports. So there it goes. So that's what it's going to look like when it prints. It's going to have all those things on, and then you, you take them off. Here, quick pro tip. You want to remove these easily. If you just grab them and snap them off, it's going to damage the model, and it's a pain. Quick pro tip. Use a heat gun on it, it weakens them, and then they just fall right off. Do it uh, before you, what's called curing it. Otherwise, it's super brittle. Okay, so then I, you know, I would just do that, and then I would go in, and uh, you, you definitely, because this is going to be hanging upside down, all the ones at the lowest point, and that's what this is so great for, is you can kind of come down and see where the lowest point is. All the ones on the lowest point, right now they are medium weight, and I would just go up to heavy on all the bottom ones, because that's holding a lot of weight by the time it gets to the top and the whole model is hanging off of that, and if it falls off, you, it's ruined. It's no good. And then I also make all of the taller ones heavy. Now, of course, this depends on the size of your model. If you're printing something this big, you don't need any heavy, heavy supports. But uh, then I go in and make all the tall ones just because they have more, more they need to hold up. Um, then, uh, then there's some other really quick things you can do. Like you can have it search for islands. Islands are any pieces that aren't connected to anything because it has to be always connected to something else. Proximity makes sure that the the uh, supports aren't intersecting the model anywhere, and then uh, and then you're ready to print, and then you basically just send it, save it out as a printed file. Um, I'm not going to get into exposure settings. Anybody, any geeks in here really into exposure settings? Again, it's you and me. Uh, those are you have to change a bunch of settings depending on the resin and the, and the printer you have. So I'm not going to get into that because it's kind of technical. But you do that, you save it out, it saves it out to a file, you send it to your printer, and you're printing. So, uh, oh, here I'm just going to really quick. Don't need to save that. Um, this is the come on. This is the way that I uh, fully supported it. So I mean it looks similar but you can see where I've added the the heavy the heavy stuff and where I added some holes and so that that right there is I've printed and it turned out great. Okay. So <coughs> um, so then I print it. And so I use a resin 3D printer, the one that I use. I have several, but the Anycubic Photon M3 Plus is the one that I use. Um, it's a great printer. There's a lot of different resin brands. If anybody has any questions on those, I've researched them a lot. Um, Elegoo also is a great brand for 3D printers in resin. So this is what the resin printer looks like. This vat down here is filled with a liquid resin. And then underneath it, uh, so this resin is liquid unless it's hit with UV light. Don't get it near the sun or it will turn hard. So you want to do it in a room that does not have sunlight shining in there. Um, so it fills with a liquid there, and then underneath it are UV lights that shine up and harden each layer. And they shine up and they, they're masked out by the shape of that particular 
slice that it made. So that, and then this part here comes down, it shines up and it hardens it on a thin piece of film. Uh, and, then the, and then when this part here moves up, that sticks and pulls it off the film. And so it's making a thin, thin, hundred thousands of layers at a time. And it just goes down and up and you can watch it. In fact, I think I have a video here that just shows it. Oh, and this 3D printer, one of the things I like is here's the resin. Say I'm printing something that's bigger than the amount of resin that I have in here. This kind of just sucks more into there. So, um, yeah. So this is kind of what it looks like as it's 3D printing something. This is sped way up. You can see it's like, it's almost like magic. It just kind of rises up out of there. And you can see the time lapse of the time over there. So it takes hours and hours and hours. So, yeah. <coughs> And then, uh, after it's printed, then you clean it up. And cleaning it up involves washing it with alcohol. Or if you have a water-based, um, a water-washable resin, you can use water. Um, here is a downside to 3D printing. You need to wash it in alcohol or water. And then you're left with alcohol and water that is filled with liquid plastic. What do you do with that? You can't dump it in the sink. You have two options. One is you take it to a hazardous waste place and get rid of it. Or, this is what I do, is I pour it into big jar, glass jars. I, I set it in the sun. What does the sun do? It hardens the plastic. The plastic hardens and goes down to the bottom, and now it's just regular plastic. Then I pour off the water or the alcohol, and I reuse it, and I just pull the plastic off the bottom, and throw it in the trash, recycle it, whatever, because it's regular plastic at that point. So those are your two options. Do not throw that down the sink or outside, because that would be bad. OK, uh, Okay. so I'm going to show you just quickly. Uh, so I have that, that, that forehead dog. Um, this I also like to finish and paint these in all different ways. So. Um, and make them look like they're not plastic. So here's a bunch of these guys, and you can see they, they all look different. Um, and so I paint with, uh, I prime it, and then I paint usually with acrylic paint is my favorite. That's just, in fact, here's a little clue. I use the exact same paint that I used on the murals. Acrylic paint is great. Now some of these are a metallic special paint. Um, but you can see it's super fun. And what's great about 3D printing is you can print more than one and then make them look all different, all different ways. And the small ones I, I will print in a batch. So I'll print like eight at a time. Yes? What do you use to fill in the forehead hole? Ah, excellent question. So when you're filling in holes, you can use a lot of different stuff. What I use is if it's a small hole, I just put more resin in there. And then I just shine a little UV flashlight on it, and it hardens it. You can use glue, you can use wood filler. I like to use resin because the rest of it's resin. Now, if it's a big hole, this is where resin 3D printing really will, if you feel like you are, have a bent towards being a mad scientist, it's awesome. So what I found is I take some resin, I mix it with some cornstarch, it becomes a paste, fill in the hole, shine a light on it, it's rock hard, works great. So, all right. So there's those. I wanted to show you these two. So uh, I'm going to show you, um, let's see. So uh, yeah, so there's the, the, you know, the mural that's out there. Uh, hey, there's the penguins. So that was super fun to do. And oh, I might show you that if I have time. That's a, a walkthrough of it as I was doing it. Um, so. Uh, here is painted kangaroo directly from there and that's painted and that's all painted with acrylic paint um, okay and then I showed you there's the the penguin in full color using the colors that are in the mural uh, but I thought, why not make it look like it's out of bronze while I'm at it? 
Yes, yes, yes. On a random printer, can you do more than one color at a time? No. Yes. Nope. Uh, you could technically pour in other colored resins as it's printing, and you'll get a swirly sort oh, of a thing okay. going. Okay. I've seen people put glitter in the resin as they're oh, printing it. Okay. <laughs> you can do all that kind of funky okay. stuff. Yep. But yeah, it's mostly a... Yes? What kind of resin is that? Okay. There are lots of different kinds of resin for 3D printing. There are like hundreds and hundreds of different kinds. But it's specifically resin for resin 3D printing. But you can get clear, you can get opaque, you can get any single color. You can get one that's really tough, one that's really brittle, one that bends. Somebody say no? I can't. I don't know the technical of the actual. Uh, yes. Yep. You specifically, and it comes in bottles, like about that size, and you pour it in. Yep. It is. Uh, it is something that you don't want to eat, <laughs> <laughs> or even get on your skin. I would. I always use gloves. You don't. Don't get it on you. Yes. I'm actually an expert on the safety side of resin. There he goes. Photopolymer. Yeah. Inside it, you had some weird. Um, I don't know, some makeup you have where there's like things that separate over time and you just leave it there and yeah, shake it before you use it. Same thing with the resin. If you get it on your skin, you gotta wash it off with soap and water and then put some lotion on. Dawn. Dawn is really good. Dawn is good. Treat it as if you've gotten, if you get it on you, treat it as though you've just t touched uh, poison ivy. And so you want to wash it off right away. Um, I also think it's good to like rub it with a towel afterwards too because that, yeah. But you don't want to get it on you. Yes? Um, I send them the 3D model, and then yes, they will 3D print it and make molds. And then they do it with molds. Yes, they'll make a mold, and then yeah, they don't 3D print every one of these, or it would take you know forever. But yeah, they'll they'll make a mold based on the 3D print. Yes, back there. Um, can I bother again? Don't you're not bothering me. I want questions. <laughs> okay. Resin is, uh, you, you just have to be careful. So you, you just, you want to have it in a well-ventilated place. Uh, you want to not, you know, you want to have gloves on. Um, so you don't want to have it like sitting in your kitchen or your dining room. You want it like out in a garage with some ventilation. I wouldn't put it in your bedroom, uh, a resin 3D printer. Um, so yeah, you want it in a well-ventilated area. You don't want to touch the resin. Um, and <coughs> you, you basically just have to be, be careful with it. That's the downside to resin is that you have to deal with the resin. And also, you know, you, want to, you don't want it to have, you want to have it where if you, like I get, I have mine on these mats, silicon mats. So if I spill some on it, it's super easy to clean up. If you spill it on some cloth, you have a, a couple options. Uh, one is to throw the cloth away or to shine a UV light on it to harden it. And then it's ruined the cloth, but yeah. So yes, you have to be very careful with the resin. The upside to it is it prints way smoother, way more detail, it's great for characters, all of that stuff. Um, the downside is it's messy and you have to be careful with it. Yes. And there are tons of different resins. Some smell more than others. Some are very stinky. Some are not as stinky. Stinky. Smell bad. Some of them smell really bad. Some of them don't have much of a smell at all. OK, so uh, and then I, I paint them, and then I seal them, uh, seal them up so that they're uh, ready to go. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, any, any other questions? Yes. Uh, are, there, are there programs where you can actually take a plastic piece and, and copy it? And then 3D scan it? Yeah. 3D scanners. Yes, there's, uh, there are actual 3D scanners that you can, and there are different kinds that you can take an object and 
3D scan it. There's also photogrammetry where you can take lots of photos of something and then it converts it into a 3D model. So uh, the 3D scanner device is going to be a lot more accurate. The, there you go. I would go check that out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes? So I'm familiar with ZBrush. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Yep. Uh, yep. In fact, if you like uh, what's called polygonal modeling, you could do the, that in and then bring it in and then sculpt on it. So yeah. Yep. And it's it actually does some re what's called remeshing and uh, better than ZBrush. What's amazing is it's got all these layers like in any other paint program, so you can paint or sculpt on different layers. And if you remesh it, it keeps all of those somehow. Like you can't break it. It's insane. I still don't understand it. But yeah, if you're familiar with painting in layers, like in Procreate, you can do the same thing in Nomad when you're sculpting, and but then you can constantly remesh it, and it just keeps all that, all those layers. So that's cool. Yes, there was. Uh, there was. Did you? Okay. You. Uh, I've been up to 12 million and it didn't Crash. didn't do yeah it was fine so probably more than that it would start to slow down a little the thing is the new iPads with the M1 and M2 chip are just as good as a really good PC so they it it does great um, yes are there places that give training on how to do all this or just people mostly learn it on their own uh, there are online places. Yes, there's on lo lots of online training and lots of YouTube videos that will run through all of these things. Uh, if you want to learn more about Nomad, uh, there's a guy called Drug Free Dave. <laughs> <laughs> In case you were wondering where he stands on those. Uh, and his tutorials are really good for Nomad, starting from the very beginning and moving up. Um, and Nomad is, yeah, like I said, a couple hours and you'll be making stuff in Nomad. A couple hours in ZBrush and you'll be banging your head against the wall. <laughs> yes? Uh, did you start out as an artist? Um, like, what, how did you kind of come to, to be doing this? OK, yeah, good question. So uh, yeah, I've been an artist since I was a kid, um, but yeah, I've been doing it professionally since 1991. Um, and uh, so I was uh, an illustrator on children's software at Microsoft for a long time. I worked at the studio that made VeggieTales for about five years. Um, so I've been doing 3D computer graphics for a long time. Um, and I illustrate children's books and write children's books too. So yeah. But, and then, uh, so I've had a long, a long history of doing 3D computer graphics. I've been into that since forever. But the 3D printing is like reinvigorated me because now I can hold what I make, you know, and I can paint it different ways and I can have all sorts of different, you know, it's super fun, super fun. So yeah, I love being able to bring everything that I've been doing up into now and now into 3D printing and the toys and all that, so yes. Uh, uh, getting exposure settings right is not always fun. So you, there's a trial and error to your settings before it, things will print properly. Sometimes it goes super easy, sometimes it's not. Uh, the, uh, when you spill the resin, that is never fun. Uh, that's why you want to set it up in a way that if a spill happens, you, you, you know, it's on something that's easy to clean up. Um, uh, and then random failures that you don't know why they happen, and you have to sort of figure it out. Um, that, that's what I would say. But on the flip side, once you dial in your settings on a certain resin and you keep using it, you, you're, you don't get as many, you're not going to get many failures at all. So there's that upfront kind of getting things going. So, yes? Uh, 
why do I use the fixed Boolean? The fixed oh, the fixed geometry. Um, I have found that if I don't do that, I will often open it in Lychee and it will say there's something wrong with the model. Probably. Uh, it, yeah, it's running through a couple different things to fix it, but yeah, I found, and sometimes it, it, sometimes it comes into Lychee and there are no errors, but I found if I hit that button, I almost never get any errors, so. Yeah, um, you know, it only takes one second to hit the button, so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to do it, even if I don't, doesn't, doesn't matter. Any other questions? Um, I've got a bunch of prints up here if you want to come and, come and take a look. Um, again, I've got the toy prototypes of these, so this is what the actual toys will look like. Um, if you're interested in these toys, they will be available in a few months. You can sign up to learn about them at my website, breadwig.com. If you haven't seen the mural over there, go take a look at it. That was fun. Yeah, you're welcome.